So MySQL for system administrators. This is not for DBAs. This is for people who have to maintain regular operating systems and occasionally delve into databases. Um, some of the things that I'm going to cover will actually work for other types of databases, but I'm just going specifically with MySQL. All right. So one of the things is if you have to connect to many databases, you can end up with an environment where that you can't read because of the size of the print, but all of those just say MySQL greater than. Uh, if you've used MySQL on a regular basis, you're familiar with that. Um, but if you're talking to multiple databases, like I have to do for work, uh, which one am I talking to? Right? Uh, especially if I come back to it the next day and I see something going on, I, I need to know where, what it is that I'm talking to. So the monotony of having everything be the same. We don't like that. But we have a solution. And there we go. <laughs> We are system mins. We know how to fix shell prompts. PS1. So I can now see which machine I'm on and where, what, are, what directory I'm in, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a problem with that for MySQL. PS1 doesn't work. Neither does PS2. So we have something else called MySQL under bar PS1. We can set that and have that then reflect which machine we're talking to, which database. So the one I have here is for an example. Uh, I export it. I show which user we are, so who we're connected to the database as, uh, what the host name is for the database, so which box I'm on. And then I also, um, in, my, in that case, the, the percent and the other stuff after there are, are dropping some extra information off the host name. And then the last piece is the database. So I know which database I'm talking to. Because um, if you go drop table in the wrong database, uh, not, not a good day. <laughs> Um, and if you go drop table in prod because you thought you were in dev, also not a good day. Um, so it's important to see which pieces you're, you're talking to. Uh, I will be on call next week. I will potentially be talking to dozens of databases at a time because multiple things can all happen at the same time. Um, but also in the environment we're at, we, can, we might have to talk to multiple databases for one particular issue. Um, doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Um, so it's really important for me to know which database I'm talking to and who I'm talking to it as. So I know what permissions I have and what it is I'm doing. Um, because again, you know, I get paged at you know, 6 o'clock in the morning and I, st and I do something in prod that I shouldn't have done in prod. Not going to be a good 7 o'clock call, you know, right? So. Uh, so this is an example of how those change if you've got really good eyes and you can read the micro font. Sorry about that. Um, but basically, in this particular case, I'm showing that we're connected as root on all four databases. But now we also see the host name. Uh, one is called MySQL still. Uh, another one's called Tools. Another one's called uh, Sonic. Um, and then I show a, a demo of changing to different databases so you can see which database you're talking to. Um, but a standard text prompts, and I was trying to make that bigger, and I did not succeed yet. So sorry. Uh, the, the slides will be available so you can go look at them with a magnifying glass or a really big screen if you want to. All right. Uh, so there's also, that's cluster SSH talking to four boxes in parallel, um, but it still needs two passwords in order to, to, to connect into those. So you need the password for the machine you're talking to and then also the password for MySQL. Uh, I will leave the password SSH as an exercise for, the, for home. Uh, you, it's a different talk. I've given that talk as well. You can, it's probably online. Uh, and here's a copy of the home game if you would like to play it. All right. And thank you to Brian for the uh, image. All right. So non-automatic authentication for MySQL. Uh, you can say, you know, MySQL, you, the username, and PF, and then give the password. Um, there are a couple of problems with that. Uh, PSAUXXW is showing you. Um, your password can show up in your process list. So if other people have access to that machine, they can then inadvertently or vertently see your password. It also shows up in the shell history for the machine that you're using. So if anybody gets a copy of that history file, um, they can see the password. Uh, there's also a MySQL history file that it ends up in. Um, although that one theoretically gets sanitized, but there's a recent version that had some issues and so, but it's better not to use it so that you don't have to worry about it getting there to begin with. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing is 
uh, if you're copying and pasting screenshots or commands or giving screenshots, uh, it can end up in that. So you can inadvertently be giving that information if you're not sanitizing those properly. Um, so generally, we don't want passwords on the command line, uh, not in clear text. Uh, so we can uh, uh, use the same command, but now instead of giving the password on the, on the command line, the dash P without a password says, oh, prompt for the password. So now it'll prompt for the password and you give that. You're still interactive. You're still typing the password in order to log in or copying and pasting out of a, a password manager or something like that. Uh, but now the password isn't on the command line. So all those things that we just talked about uh, here with the shell history, et cetera, the password isn't showing up. So at least we're not advertising the, the password or keeping it for posterity uh, in, in clear text. But we still have to interactively log in. Depending on what you're doing, that actually may, might be a problem. So if you're working on tools, they're supposed to automatically do something. As sysadmins, non-DBAs, we're probably working more on tools that go through and do something automatically for us rather than going in and logging in and, and tweaking things by hand anyway. Uh, so there are some options for automatic authentication. Um, specifically, you have the .my.cnf in your home directory. Um, and by the way, if you're also, as a sysadmin, trying to keep people from automatically logging in, pay attention to this slide, right? This is the places to go look for those things. Um, and specifically, look in roots. Uh, dot my, uh, dot cnf, um, because a lot of times root gets set up with that. Um, also, if you're using a Debian-based system, so Debian, Ubuntu, uh, Mint, etc., uh, you will you will probably have an Etsy uh, MySQL Debian dot cnf, and that is what Debian uses for some uh, maintenance types of things that Debian does, including automatic backups for you for um, uh, upgrades. So when you do an upgrade from one version, you know, packaged version of MySQL to another packaged version of MySQL. Uh, Debian will go make a backup for you and then do the upgrade uh, so that if the upgrade fails or there's problems, you have a backup of it, which is a really actually a good smart feature to have in package management. Uh, and then the last one is MySQL underbar PWD all caps. Uh, and that is a shell environment, uh, a shell variable that you can set. Uh, and that would be in, used in scripts. So if you have a script that's going through and doing that and they set that that variable, it will be used for authentication. And that's actually the tool that I recommend using if you're needing to write a script, set MySQL under bar PWD, uh, and then your environment, your MySQL will know to go look at that. Uh, and that's reducing the risk of, of other things getting to it. All right. Uh, MySQL account limits. Again, this is from a sysadmin perspective. You're creating accounts for somebody. Uh, MySQL account names are limited to 16 characters. It's really annoying, <laughs> especially if you want to give a descriptive account names so you can know what that account was used for. You gave somebody access, and what are they doing with it? Um, so that is hard coded in both the database and the clients. Uh, at scale, as Brian mentioned, I gave the presentation, uh, and Dave Stokes was there, uh, who is the community manager for MySQL, and he looked at, he looked at me. He's like, "Yeah, that is kind of annoying." So you know, maybe I've, I finally tweaked the right person about it, and they're going to go fix it, uh, especially when I mentioned the other line there. Uh, so the MySQL account limits is a reminder that database designers brought us Y2K, for those of you that remember Y2K. Um, so anyway, it, hopefully they'll, they'll fix that someday, but don't count on it. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, if you do account names based with uh, some kind of extension to tell you about read-only, read-write, et cetera, remember to leave room for that in your account limits and your account names. Uh, authorization. Quick and easy thing for, for sysadmins. If they have select only, they have read only access. So if all they can do is select, they can't change anything in the database. If they can uh, delete, insert, or update, just like the name sound, those are, are uh, read write, are write access. Generally, you want read write access if you're doing that, so they will also need selects for the read write access. Um, you can give write-only access that's beyond what we're doing, um, and developers should learn more about that because there's times when you just need to throw data at the database and not, not expose uh, that sec for security reasons. Um, but that's beyond the scope of, of what we're going to talk about tonight. So read-only, select. If they need read-write, give them a select, bleed, up, insert, and update. Um, for stored procedures, 
So stored procedures are basically MySQL or other databases have the same thing. They're their own internal language. It's not SQL, the structured query language. It's their own like scripting language for doing stuff. So you can basically set up something to go, uh, you know, run a trigger or, or other things where you can write write some actual code uh, a little bit easier to do something program programmatically uh, than with uh, just SQL. Um, generally, though, if you can do it in SQL, do it in SQL rather than doing it in, in, a, uh, in a stored procedure. Uh, but if you do need a stored procedure, uh, look at uh, definer and invoker. So definer is who's allowed to create a stored procedure, but then when the, when the uh, invoker is who it runs as. So think of invoker as sudo. Right? So whoever created the thing and, and owns the script is the owner of the file. But then invoker, well, invoker isn't sudo so much. Yes, it is. Because if, even if I run it, it runs as the invoker. So um, the definer is who owns it. So if you, if you think of, a, of a, a, a file on the file system, bin ls, right? It's owned by root. Uh, if I run that normally, then it runs as me. But if we set it up with, with a, a, a set UID, then it runs as, as whoever the set UID owner is. And that's what Invoker is. Uh, and again, look at the MySQL documentation. Uh, if you probably don't do this very often, so even if you think you understand it, I recommend looking at the MySQL documentation when you do it just to make sure uh, it's going to behave like you want it to behave. Uh, backups don't really matter, right? It's the restores, restorals that are, that are important. Uh, so we can, and, th and this is actually really pertinent to, to MySQL. Um, if you've got backups that aren't working, then it doesn't, you know, they, they don't do you any good. If you're not testing them, they don't do you any good. You need to be testing them to make sure they work. But you also need a restoral process that works. So the primary tool that a lot of people use for backups or have used over the years is called MySQL dump. It dumps a copy of the database. It's a great tool. Um, however, restorals with MySQL dump can take forever. And I, by forever, I do mean forever. Um, so at the previous company I was at, we had MySQL set up. We were using MySQL dump for backups, uh, and they weren't being tested. I said, okay, well, let's change that. So I started testing them. Uh, and uh, after working with a bunch of people who know a lot more about MySQL than I do, um, I got it down to uh, three days for a restoral. Uh, in three days, the company would no longer exist. So that didn't really do me any good. Those backups were completely worthless. They were just taking up space. Um, they, they, the only thing that they would do for me is if there were lawsuits after the fact, then we would have data that we could prove for, for, the, for the lawsuits. But the company would have not, not been around at that point had uh, MySQL been down for three days. So those backups were com completely worthless for me. If you've got small, backup, if small databases, MySQL dump is probably great. Right? And I actually recommend, even if you use the, the mechanisms I'm going to talk about, uh, I kind of recommend getting a MySQL dump every once in a while, uh, just because it is the thing that's been around the longest, and it is the thing that is the most bulletproof. Um, so you know, it's good to have that sample data, you know, that 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 pure MySQL setup or uh, database dump laying around, even if you know there's there's some some problems in there, because even if you get uh, if you use another mechanism to get your data back quickly, you can then use your MySQL dump to later do an audit to make sure you didn't miss something. Right? Or if some part's missing, you can use the MySQL dump to maybe just go grab that part that you're missing and not have to worry about the whole thing. I do also recommend getting schema dumps on a regular basis. Uh, depending on how often your schemas change or how paranoid you are about somebody getting into a database or if you have to deal with socks or things like that, you might even want to do a, a schema dump every day. Doesn't take up much space, doesn't take up much processing power, and you can go through and see if anything's changed. Uh, if you have uh, developers that have access to root, don't. But if you don't have a choice, you want to do schema dumps on a very regular basis. So when they say they haven't changed anything when the database stops working, you can go say, well, what are these new fields? Or where's this table come from? Right? Um, or where did that table go? <laughs> so um, schema dumps are a great way of doing that. These are the uh, options I suggest for MySQL dump. Uh, no data. We're just getting the schema. We don't care about the data uh, for this. Uh, we want to do get routines. 
Uh, Want to skip the add locks and skip opt because they're giving us extra stuff that we don't care. Uh, triggers is actually on by default, but just in case something else is going through things, you want to make sure you get your triggers or triggers and routines. So speci specify that, and then grab all the databases. Uh, if you only care about a couple of databases, or if you need to keep things separate, for instance, socks, non-socks, etc., uh, you can then list the specific databases. Uh, look at the MySQL dump uh, man page for that. Uh, and oh, and then you also back up the MySQL dot, uh, proc table if you want to uh, preserve uh, routine creation timestamps. So if you are putting your routines into revision control, or if you need to be able to do security audits, uh, you might want to make sure that you're specifically backing up that particular table in order to maintain those timestamps, uh, especially if you need to be able to put them back later on and stuff. So, All right. Uh, so a mechanism I, I, did, I set up at the last company is called Percona Extra Backup. It's a really cool tool. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty awesome. Uh, still uses a lot of resources. So I would recommend if you're using this, you need to run it on a slave um, because it's going to beat up your database for a little while. Uh, but basically what it does is takes a crash dump of your InnoDB databases and then restores everything back to a particular p point in time. Uh, the nice thing about it is your backup does take a lot of resources, but when you're done, you end up with a file system. So your restoral is the time it takes you to copy the files to where you want them and start MySQL again. So restorals are quick and easy. That's, that's awesome. Um, and it does some, does some extra magic and it's kind of fun. Uh, and actually it's a good way to learn a little bit about, about, about my, uh, MySQL and how Inno, uh, InnoDB work uh, if you're wanting to do that. But uh, the quicker and easier way to do that is to use snapshots. As system ends, we should be able to set up LVM put our MySQL database on a LVM partition, make sure you leave enough room for the snapshots. Uh, the thing that was missing from the last company and I couldn't take the database down to fix it, that's why I was using extra, uh, extra backup. Um, the, the snapshots still require a short read lock. You basically need to lock the database to make sure that nothing's changing on the disk so you can do, so you can do your snapshot. Um, and there's a, cool, a tool now called My LVM Backup that you can use that will take care of most of that for you and you don't have to worry about uh, things. Uh, look, at, look into that tool. There's a couple of other tools, but that one's the one that I believe has been around the longest. Logical Volume Manager, yep. So, um, and then uh, log files. So the error log, <laughs> keep an eye on that. That's where, where MySQL says, hey, things are broken. Can you please come fix something? Uh, you also get some other stuff in there. Um, so if you alert on my on error log changing, you're going to get more alerts than you want. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to ignore them. So if you, I, if you are monitoring, which you should be, uh, I would suggest you look at error log and, and, and any time you, you get new data in there, uh, you uh, alert on it. Um, one of the things that you'll end up with in there some is, is uh, failed connections if your, data, your devs are doing things that, that are bad, um, but the, that's just an excuse to remind them to fix it, uh, and if they don't, add them to the pager list for the error log so that every time it goes off, they get notified as well because they're the ones that have to fix it. General log. General log is awesome. It is the war and piece of data. Right? It's, it's how you turn MySQL into SendMail. SendMail, you know, if, if you turn on extra verbose logging in SendMail, uh, for every piece of mail that you get through, there'll be like 400 pages worth of logging, right? General, the general log is, is trying to do that for MySQL. You get a lot of data. Um, but uh, if you've got a heavily used database, one, you're using a lot of resources, so you'll, you'll slow things down. Uh, you will also start packing up, uh, adding on to the file system. So you can run out of, out of disk space. So generally, we don't leave the general log on. We turn it on to grab a snapshot of what's going on in the database so we can do some debugging. And then we turn it back off and then go through the logs. Um, but it is a very useful tool. Uh, and it's fairly easy to understand. Uh, looking at it, you can, you can extrapolate with what most of the data is without having to uh, look it up, even though it's, it's uh, a little cryptic. Uh, so that's, I, that's good. Uh, and then the slow query log. Um, this, with newer versions of MySQL, you can go through and set that for less than sub-second time periods. Um, so for instance, if you have a, uh, a transactional database where you're, you're doing a bunch of small transactions, then you care if, it's, if you have, if you have uh, um, 
queries that are taking a full second or taking a half second because you need quicker response times. Uh, if you are doing a reporting database where you have huge reports that can take a day or you know, an hour or whatever to run, then you want, your, you want to bump up your slow query log to be something more reasonable for what they are. Um, but up until the last couple of years, we couldn't do those sub-second uh, um, uh, query, uh, 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 query, slow queries. So that's, that's been nice that they've added that feature for us. Uh, for querying data, so when we go say, you know, select star from this table and do this, whatever else, right? We can use the tools we know. So you can learn SQL, select star from this table where this thing equals that and that thing is more than that and something else and, and today is Tuesday, right? Um, but there's a lot of knowledge that's taking place, that takes place to know the, the, the language and then the other thing is to know it, to, to use it efficiently. Um, for normal data sets that we as sysadmins will be looking at, we can use the tools that we already are familiar with. So those of you who are do friends with Dr. Who, this is a sonic screwdriver, build your own. That's what we do. We take a bunch of small tools and we pipe them together to build the tool that we want for the thing that we're doing right now. So as a sysadmin, we can do that. We can say, MySQL-E says run this, run this query, select album from music, so I'll just say, give me all of them. And then I can pipe that to grep and go look for the thing I want. So what I can, whatever I can do with grep, whatever I can do with awk or sed, I can now do with the, the, the output from that query. I don't have to know SQL. All I have to do is know is a basic, basic uh, um, uh, select. If you need to join tables, you have to learn a little bit about that. But it's, that's not very difficult. Uh, and yeah, we're beating it with a sledgehammer. But sometimes the sledgehammer is the tool you have. Um, and as I say, for small data sets, it works. If you get 2 billion rows in that table, that's going to hurt. <laughs> but if you've got something with just a couple million rows in it, that's really not that painful. Yes, I could make it a lot quicker by doing an SQL. But in the time that, as a, as a sysadmin, it takes me to figure out how to do it in SQL, I, it would have been way faster to just do it with a pipe and, and use the tools I already know. Uh, again, uh, MySQL each, those, in this case, I'm saying run this, com this command. This particular command is show slave status. So I'm asking the slave database, what condition you're, are you in? And that gives you a long screen of things. Well, really, for the most part of the system ends, we only care about a few of those. So I'm piping that to grep and saying, just show me the parts that I care about. Is my slave IO running? Is my, am I talking to the master? Uh, and wh where are we at? Uh, and then also, I'm looking for errors that, that the slave is talking about, is going through. Again, as a system in, we, we're looking at a subset. I don't even know if DBAs look at all the, the data in there, but this simplifies things for us. In MySQL, you can say page or less, so you, now you get a pager for your queries. So you can go through and look at things one page at a time. Or you can just use screen and go back and forth with that. Uh, and then MySQL does have libreadline support, so you can set it up to use VI or Emacs uh, line editing. Some database stuff. We will cover a little bit of database stuff. All right. If, if you don't know any different, you, nobody gives you specifics for some kind of requirement, use InnoDB. Uh, do not use MyISM. Use InnoDB. It's a much more stable, better uh, 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 table format um, or uh, 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 engine. Uh, don't change the internal uh, databases, though. So MySQL, Information Schema, Performance Schema, and those are all internal databases that MySQL uses. I would think that it would be nice to put those in into B, but they haven't done it. And I presume they know more than I do about databases since they actually wrote the database. So I'll leave it with what they have until they tell me otherwise. But anything that we're creating, anything your devs are creating, when they say, say hey, we're going to create this new database, remind them to make it into B and be working with that from the, from the get-go. Uh, you need to make sure you have proper data, your backups for that. But we've already talked about that. You should be having proper backups in place anyway. If you use InnoDB, which you should, uh, then you want to set the file per table option. Unless you're talking about a very small database, which case you don't really care about any of this stuff because it's too small to care. Um, but if, the, if it might be growing or it might be used a lot, use file per table. Uh, InnoDB has uh, um, cache files where they put everything together. Um, but that means that if one database or one uh, uh, um, starts growing, it can basically squeeze out the others a little bit. Uh, so use file per table to begin with. 
uh, and that gives you a few more options as a sysadmin. Um, for instance, you can go through and start putting uh, tables on different disks and stuff, which will scare the heck out of the DBAs, and rightfully so. However, you know, we can cheat. We're sysadmins. We're fine. Uh, and then for faster shutdown. So if you need to shut down the database in order to do some maintenance, uh, if you need to restart it, uh, set global InnoDB max dirty pages PCT to zero. Give it a little while. And basically what that's doing is saying, write things to disk as fast as you can. You're not going to get it all the way down to zero. But, uh, and search for that for, for more, more hints on how to use it. Um, but that helps a lot. Uh, where I'm at now, I was the sole owner of a very busy database um, that would take 40 minutes to restart because we had so much going on with it. Um, by using this, I would set that ahead of time, get things down, I got it down to where the reboots, the restarts were still taking about five minutes, but that was significantly better than 40 minutes to, to shut down the, the database. Uh, and it also comes up in better shape. You have, you have less that you have to do after you come back up. Slaves. Talked about slaves a little bit. So in the, in the database environment, our database world, you have a master, you have a slave. You'd make the changes to the master. So that's the one you write to. You don't ever write to the slaves, period. Don't do it. Just, if some developer says, oh, I've got this thing, no. <laughs> Tell them no. Uh, there's, a, there's a few exceptions, but you know, at the point where you need to make those exceptions, they should have hired a real DBA at that point, so that person should be handling it not a, a, a sysadmin. Um, so you've got your master where you do all your writes. You then have a copy that goes to your slave. You can do reads from the slave, so you can offload some of the, the traffic by do, doing that. You can also use your slave for your DR and backup. So you can put your slave in a different data center in a different state. So if your master goes down, you can turn your slave into, into the master and, and let it start run, uh, doing stuff. Um, and that way, if you lose an entire site, your DR is already set up. You have a copy of the database. It just takes you a couple minutes, a little bit of DNS, in order to go through and, and convert that over. But when you do, there's a couple of different options, actually three options now for uh, replication, for copying the data from the master to the slave. Statement-based replication, uh, that says, OK, you've got this statement. They said, uh, update uh, um, foo.bar where um, x equals 10. So you're going through in every, every place where in the, every line in the uh, row in, the, in that table where x equals 10, you're going through and updating uh, um, uh, that particular column. Um, some of those types of statements, though, are uh, non-deterministic. So in other words, you say, go do this, and you don't know which order things are going to go in. Uh, and that might matter. Um, now, one of the ones that's really obvious if, is if you use rand, say, do random things. Random things are not deterministic. Go figure, right? Um, at least <laughs> they're not supposed to be, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, but there's some other things where, where you get non-deterministic be behavior. If you say, uh, update this to now, well, now on the slave and now on the master are different times because it takes a while for, the, for it to go over. And it might be just you know, microseconds, but depending on where you're at, that, that is enough to make a difference. Um, so statement-based replication is not safe for all types of, of statements. Um, you can then use row-based replication, which says, for every row that changes, send the entire new row over to the, the slave and just change the entire row. Right? R-sync my database. Right? Um, but depending on the type of load you have, you might be changing a lot of, of rows. If you say update table and set x equal 10, now every single row in that table changes. And if that table has 10 million rows, you're sending 10 million rows from your master to your slave, all that bandwidth and the lag that comes with that. Uh, and your slave is single-threaded. So your, your master can be doing a bunch of stuff in parallel, but your slave is applying things in, in uh, um, serial. So you might end up with some, some problems where your slave gets behind because it takes longer to, to, to do things on the slave. So row-based replication is also not perfect. With newer versions of MySQL, there's now a mixed uh, uh, you, uh, based rec replication, where MySQL tries to do the smart thing and figure out which of those two would be appropriate for the uh, particular uh, um, update. And so generally, as a, as a sysadmin, use mixed. Let MySQL figure it out, right? Um, but if you're not certain, 
uh, or if, if, you've, if you're worried that there might be problems, row-based replication is generally the way to go. That's safe for almost everything. It just can use a lot more bandwidth for, for getting to your slave. Now, if you're using uh, uh, disaster recovery type of stuff with Corusync and DRBD, do not use the normal init scripts for MySQL. Make sure you use the ones that are used for Corusync. If you use Corusync, you should already know that. But uh, as somebody who's had Knock go through and start databases with, with the init script instead of Corusync, you know, just remove that. <laughs> just take that option away from them so you don't have to worry about recovering databases at 2 o'clock in the morning, things like that. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Corusync and DRBD, uh, there are great tools for sysadmin to know for high availability. Uh, Corusync will take care of the services, and then DRBD is copying the data back and forth. <coughs> so we actually set up our masters where we have two systems setting up, not quite side by side, but near side by side, uh, so that we, ha we don't have any latency in the links. Um, and uh, any change that's made on the master disk gets copied over to the secondary, the, the passive slave, or the passive system that does not have the file system mounted. And then if our, if our master goes down, so for instance, somebody comes by with a sledgehammer or too much water gets to the data center, uh, and the master goes down, then Corosync will notice that, that it's down and start up MySQL on the other system. So you get fairly quick uh, restart, you know, talk, talking about a couple seconds worth of restart time. And that's safe, that's fairly safe to do automatically. Automatically starting your slave because you think your master's down, that actually has a lot of different problems for converting this, the slave to the master. Um, but with DRBD and, and Corosync, it, you're fairly safe with that. Uh, the, the problem with it is you, for every database that you build, you buy two machines. So uh, database systems tend to be expensive, so you're doubling the price of it. Um, but depending on what, what uh, value you have you know, in keeping your database up, it is, you know, what's the cost of having your database go down is, is the other way to look at it. Uh, if you have questions about that, uh, talk to me afterwards. All right. The monitoring. If you set it up, you should monitor it. We, we, have, we talked about uh, backups. You should also have, you know, make sure you have backups you can use. You should also be monitoring to make sure it's up and doing the things you want it to do. Looking for slow queries, looking for errors, uh, you know, checking to make sure you're not running out of space, the, the general things like that. Uh, and that's also a good way uh, if you've got you know, monitoring with graphs, you can go through and as a sysadmin, you might not know everything that's going on with the database, but when you look at the graphs and see this huge spike, you might, hey, that might be it, right? Okay, so uh, Percona monitoring plugins are, are the things that I recommend. Uh, they can work with Nagios, Zabbix, and Cacti. They might work with other tools as well, um, but I know that they will work with those. Um, I th believe they were originally written for Cacti, um, but I know that they, they work with the other ones as well. Uh, and they, they gr grab just about everything that you can think of uh, for MySQL. Um, character sets. So just like your environment, you can have different languages, different character sets. So for instance, uh, my systems I usually set up in German. Um, for the database, I don't do that because other people are using it. Uh, MySQL for a while was defaulting to Swedish. Uh, so, it, presuming you care about what language you're getting things back in, if you're putting English data in, you want English data back out, uh, you want to make sure you set your character set right. Um, I just recommend, one, check it all the time anyway, but the other thing is anytime you create a, a, a database, go through it and, and specify the character set in the creation uh, command, and that way you know you're safe. Uh, and also, if you're doing UTF, et cetera, uh, look, in, look into that for MySQL and make sure that, that it's going to do what you want to do, and again, then spe specify it. Now, for the community, uh, we are now have uh, competition within the community, right? So we've had MySQL around for a long time, uh, and then uh, Percona was a company that did uh, MySQL uh, consulting, uh, and a couple people from there that used to be at, at MySQL AB back when it was still MySQL ABB before Sun bought it. And then when Sun bought it, the community got a little bit unhappy. And when Oracle bought it, the community got, oh my god, scared. So Percona came out and said, hey, we'll just have our own version of, of MySQL, right? Uh, and then since then, uh, Monty, who started MySQL, MySQL is named after his daughter, uh, started a, a, another company and created MariaDB, named after his other daughter, um, which has now been combined with SkySQL, and I, I forget where we're at. 
Uh, but anyway, at this point, for me as somebody who's not in the middle of it, I'm certain between the three groups there's a little bit of drama going on and stuff like that. But for those of us that are third party, for the most part, they get along fairly well. Uh, Percona and MariaDB have said that they're going to stay compatible with MySQL. So when Oracle comes out with a new version of MySQL, the Percona and MariaDB systems will also work with that. They might be a little bit behind it, um, but they're also adding some features. So there, you, you need to pay attention to that because there might be a feature in Percona that you're using that isn't available in the Oracle one. But for the most part, it's free software. We have cooperative competition. Somebody comes up with something really cool as free software, and other companies are going, oh, we can do that too, right? Um, so overall, I, I think the, the, the three communities are kind of working well to, together. Um, Oracle now has stewardship of the original MySQL. Uh, so like I said, MySQL B, AB was purchased by Sun, and then Sun was purchased by Oracle. So Oracle now owns MySQL um, in the free software community. Uh, there are a lot of people who do not particularly like or trust Oracle, uh, which is fairly well deserved by Oracle for some of the things they've done in the past. Um, and then Oracle has this other database that they sell called Oracle that costs lots and lots of money. And so we, people thought, you know, why would they want this free database to be out there when they could instead be selling you things that start with seven digits and everything? Um, but actually, from my experience, uh, talking to people in the community and being a semi-DBA for the last few years, uh, Oracle's been doing a good job of being a steward to MySQL, of adding features. They've sunk a lot of money and engineering time into improving MySQL and making it available. Mostly it's free software. They've got a couple of proprietary things that they've done. They've got a proprietary monitoring tool, but I think that was there before Oracle bought them. They've just expanded on it. There's a couple things, but for the most part, they've been really good about uh, improving MySQL and continuing to keep it in the what they call the community branch, the free software branch, and making that available for everybody to use. So overall, I think I I have been happy with Oracle stewardship of of MySQL, um, and uh, I know that one of the people I've gotten a lot of information about what's going on with MySQL and the cool features that they're doing is uh, Dave Stokes, I mentioned earlier, who is the community manager for MySQL. So he was a system in for a number of years. He's now a DBA type of thing f uh, for a while, too. Uh, but he's been very open with what's going on with Oracle. Uh, and so I see that as a good sign, you know, that they're, they're talking to us. Um, as I say, we've got the competition between the three groups and what I call cooperative competition, where they they're competing with each other, because, but because it's free software, everybody has access to all of it. So in the end, we can borrow and steal and, and, and so forth. Um, and I think that really Im improves the community for regardless of which, which particular edition that you're using. Um, all right. So some references that I, I recommend. One, scales my SQL track. Um, yes, I, as Brian mentioned earlier, I gave a presentation, this presentation at scale uh, this last year in their track. But they normally get a uh, community manager from, from Oracle, community manager from Percona, the community manager from uh, uh, MariaDB, uh, people that have been doing database stuff for, for decades that are really good. And we get some great uh, uh, presentations. Uh, a couple of other people that are, are, are MySQL consultants that are doing some really interesting things uh, with MySQL. Uh, this last year, they had a, a presentation from Baron Schwartz, who wrote the book that I'm going to mention. right? So we're getting luminaries in the, in the MySQL community coming in, and, and talking there. Uh, and a lot of those videos are online, so you can go look at them. Uh, so I really recommend following that track. And of course, if you're, for those of us here in town, we can drive to scale fairly easily. So go to scale and, and attend the track on, uh, on Friday. The MySQL documentation is great. Uh, MySQL and PHP were the first two places, the projects I saw, where the documentation was in line. And then it was basically set up with a comment section so that people who are using the tool could make comments, whether that be questions or they could be correcting the documentation saying, hey, you forgot a period here, or this part doesn't make sense. Um, and it has improved documentation over the years as well. Uh, so the MySQL documentation is actually really, really good. Uh, there's also the MySQL performance blog uh, that is uh, great, gives you a lot of innards. If you're needing to know more about MySQL, Track the MySQL performance blog. If you start searching for things and how to fix things, 
you're going to end up there anyway. So go ahead and just start reading it. Uh, the Percona Toolkit is a uh, toolkit with a bunch of different uh, um, tools. I mentioned if, if you might need to audit to see if tables are the same. It has tools for doing that. Uh, it has a lot of different things. And it's, it, we can use it from the command line, so it's a system in uh, uh, oriented type of thing that we can use. It uh, does require some knowledge of, of MySQL, uh, but you can dig into it and, and uh, um, get a lot done with that. Now, the, uh, I mentioned the MySQL performance blog. I also found the TokuDB log, blog. Now, TokuDB, up until uh, a couple of months ago, was a proprietary uh, database engine for MySQL. Uh, they have recently released it as free software, and then they more recently were purchased by uh, Percona or merged with Percona, I don't know. But then uh, now the Toku DB team and company are part of uh, Percona, uh, which will continue doing things uh, as as free software with it. Um, but the the Toku DB, um, in order to get where they were going, they had some really good articles and some videos on this is how Toku DB, DB does stuff. But they needed to explain how they were different than InnoDB. So Toku DB's documentation was a great source of figuring out how InnoDB does things because they were trying to differentiate themselves. Um, so I found that to be really uh, illuminating for understanding how InnoDB works. Uh, and, and so I recommend if you're needing to dive in and know more about MySQL, uh, go look at that. And of course, if you're needing to become really, really good at MySQL, the high performance MySQL book is the place to go. Uh, that is great deep dive into what's going on under the hood. A uh, lot of good information in that. Uh, there was a new version that came out recently. Highly recommend that if you're needing to know l more about MySQL and become proficient at MySQL, uh, that is the book to read. All right. Any questions? Yeah. So you said to use the global variable for storing the password if you wanted to use a script to do something with the database. Mm -hmm. What if you're managing multiple databases on one system? I mean, you just do one? Yeah, so you, well, if you're, so first of all, it's not a global variable, it's a variable. So in MySQL, we have global and non-global variables that makes the difference for the, for the database. From a sysadmin perspective, on the command line, it's the same. But I want, since we're talking about databases, I want to specify that. Um, so if you're needing to talk to multiple databases, then your script needs to be able to do an if-then and say, set it this way for that database, set it this way for that database, or so forth, um, which could be just in, including different configuration files. So if you have uh, databases Fred and Anka, you can have a fred.conf and an anka.conf, and then your script will go through and, and, and source the configuration file for the database that you want to talk to. Um, and this is a nice thing about this is I can now put that configuration file separate from my script so that it's not in there. Um, and as far as the script goes, I can go through and um, Set up the um, uh, source the configuration the, the the password file connect to the database and unset that variable so that that password is only available for a short period of time even within the script so reducing the exposure for somebody else to be able to come get it uh, you know if I make a mistake in the script and start outputting stuff to the commit to logs or something like that 